All right, I think we can start. Uh, so welcome everyone to this week Autonomy Talks. This week is a pleasure to have Dr. Matthew Qualheim, uh, who is a cu currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Pennsylvania, working in the DECOD lab with Professor Daniel Kolicek. Something about uh, Matthew. So uh, he received a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from Ohio University. He then moved to the University of Michigan, where he obtained a Master of Science in Electrical Engineering and in Mathematics. And he also then took the PhD in Electrical Engineering. His research interests include dynamical systems, control theory, topology, stochastic processes, and applications to robotics and biology. And today he's going to talk about uh, hierarchical composition via collapse of dimension in dynamical systems. So we are very happy to hear uh, your talk, Matthew. Go ahead, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for that introduction, Joel. Um, I, uh, yeah, so I'll be talking today about um, hierarchical composition via collapse of dimension in dynamical systems. Um, okay, so um, this talks about reduced order models, but I think I'd like to say, um, why am I even interested in, in simple models? Um, well, I think, I, I hope that we can all agree that if you're either analyzing uh, in the wild um, or in the lab, some very complicated high dimensional system, or if you're trying to control some very high degree of freedom system, uh, like a robot, um, it would be easier if those systems were lower dimensional. Um, so one idea is if you're studying a system, um, it's not always possible, but if it is, um, it seems like a good idea to identify a reduced order model. And on the next slide, I'll say more precisely what I mean by that. Um, or if you're trying to control a system and the system's natural dynamics has a sort of reduced order model already, you might want to try to exploit that reduced order model. Or if the system, if you're controlling a system like a robot, for example, um, the ghost robotics minotaur in the, in the middle there, there might not exist uh, a reduced order model naturally for the, like just for the uncontrolled dynamics. But what you might be able to do with control is to make the, the robot behave like some uh, simple reduced order model that you might have reason to believe is a good way to control a robot. Um, and the really big picture, I think it's, um, I think it's useful to understand really complicated systems uh, to the extent possible as compositions of really simple systems. And I think reduced order models, they're, they're just one kind of building block. And if, you, if a system has a reduced order model, you can think of it as a bunch of, having a bunch of other building blocks sort of organized around the reduced order model. Um, okay, so um, more specifically than mathematical models in this talk, I'm just gonna be talking about smooth dynamical systems. And so here at the top, we've got a dynamical system on some space X. Um, could be Euclidean space, could be some smooth manifold. And we've just got um, the ordinary differential equation, dx dt equals f of x, and with, which generates a flow. And then we have some lower dimensional space, capital Y, which also has got a vector field and a flow on it. And what I want to ask right now is, um, in, in a precise sense, what does it mean for the Y system to be a reduced order model for the X system? Well, I would argue that there are, there are multiple possibilities um, and there will be requirements attached to these possibilities in a bit. Um, to compare the, uh, the dynamics on these two different spaces, it seems like the best way to compare them is have, to have some kind of map uh, between the two. And one option is you have a, a map from X to Y, could be, you could think of it as some kind of nonlinear projection Another option is you have um, you have an embedding of y into x, um, so you could think of having just a copy of the y uh, space sitting inside x. Um, a third possibility, which is really just the more nuanced version of the second, is not only do you have a copy of y sitting inside x, but you also have all of the ambient dimensions um, 
collapse onto X or at least nearby. So you, you require the copy of Y to be asymptotically stable. Um, now, nothing I've said so far has anything to do with dynamics. So um, uh, I think the strongest thing you would want is you, you, want, you would want these maps to respect the dynamics in the sense that they're semi-conjugacies, i.e. that they, they send trajectories to trajectories while preserving time. Um, so that's just encoded by these commutative, by imposing that these commutative diagrams, um, or by, the, by imposing that these diagrams commute at the bottom. So it's the two um, uh, bottom left squares just say that the flow commutes, the flows commute with the, um, with the maps. And if the, uh, the maps happen to be differentiable, you can just differentiate those diagrams and you can get an infinitesimal version of this um, as well. Um, now, what this talk is going to be about is it's going to be about one class of systems which has reduced order models, um, a, a single reduced order model, which is um, somewhat magically, it's simultaneously of all three types. It will appear to only be of two types at first. Um, and so I'm going to first uh, tell you what these are. So these are normally attracting invariant manifolds um, or NIMES for short. Um, I'd like to introduce just the basic uh, uh, definition and some intuition about what those are and tell you about a couple of properties and it'll be immediate that these guys are, <coughs> excuse me, um, one of those types of reduced order models. And then I'd like to tell you about an application um, uh, of this to studying animal or robot locomotion. And um, then I'd like to go on to the third part of the talk and tell you about why I think, or tell you about why these are actually all three of those reduced order models in one. Um, and then I'd like to, in the final part of the talk, I'll go. I'll kind of extend uh, uh, what I've been talking about so far in another direction. Um, so, okay, um, you probably have seen NIMES before, <clears throat> and in fact, a, a NIME is in particular an exponentially stable um, invariant manifold. So, it's a it's a nice smooth surface inside state space, and it's invariant in the sense that if you if you're a point that starts on that um, manifold, you never leave it. And um, familiar examples of these are um, exponentially stable equilibria or fixed points, limit cycles or periodic orbits, center manifolds of fixed points. And um, another important example are um, uh, so-called attracting slow manifolds for singularly perturbed systems like um, this one. So. It's singularly perturbed because there's this small parameter epsilon multiplying the y dot term. And when epsilon becomes zero, that equation, um, that system of ordinary differential equations degenerates into a differential algebraic equation and the behavior change. But that's a common source of, um, it turns out that, that uh, systems like that are a common source of nines. So, okay. Um, What's the rough definition of a NIME? Well, um, so roughly an invariant manifold is an R NIME for some integer R. If first of all, that uh, the invariant manifold M has to be exponentially stable, but moreover, the exponential convergence rate to the manifold has to dominate any tangential exponential contraction rates by a factor of R. Um, so you have to converge to the manifold way faster than things within the manifold converge. And the formal definition looks a little more like this. So you have some ambient space Q and we have some flow on Q generated by a smooth vector field or ordinary differential equation. And um, let's just fix some integer R. So a compact submanifold M without boundary for now is an R9 if 
uh, first of all, it's got to be invariant. Second of all, pick your favorite splitting of the tangent bundle over the manifold. Um, doesn't matter which. So something like a normal bundle, for example, would be capital E there. And then um, project uh, along that splitting uh, onto the normal part, the part that's uh, roughly speaking orthogonal to um, the tangent spaces of M. And then the key requirement is that if you linearize the flow and you just have that flow act on, act on these normal vectors uh, to the manifold and you propagate them forwards and then because the splitting might not get preserved by uh, this linearized flow, you get to project the vectors back onto the normal uh, spaces. But the requirement is that when you do that, those um, normal vectors that you're propagating, they have to contract exponentially fast. And moreover, when you raise this term on the right side, which is something like the, it's something like the smallest eigenvalue of, um, uh, it's not quite, but it's, it's, a, it's close to being the smallest eigenvalue of um, that uh, linear map on the right. Um, what you think about is that, that term on the right, which is, um, enclosed in those funny brackets denoting this minimum norm of a linear operator, you should think of that as being, that's the fastest possible rate at which, um, at which trajectories within uh, the manifold, the invariant manifold can contract to one another um, infinitesimally at least. And um, so when you take that rate, that, uh, that tangent contraction rate, and you multiply it by any fact, or you raise it to any power, um, one up through R, um, the left-hand side has still got to dominate the right-hand side. And um, so those three properties are what makes an R9. Um, so if you can see from the third property, if you just set, um, if you set I equals zero on the right-hand side, you just get that um, the linearized flow uh, on the normal bundle uh, is exponentially stable. And then you can just do a, um, a Taylor polynomial estimate, basically first order. And you can prove that uh, it follows that the manifold itself is exponentially stable in the nonlinear sense. Um, conversely, um, from looking at that third property up, up there again, if you hold the right-hand side constant, but you crank up the convergence rate on the left side, the contraction rate, then um, you can make the you can make m an, an R9 for any R. So the so that's the converse here. If you hold the tangent tangential dynamics constant, um, then uh, and you crank up the uh, exponential attraction to the nine, then um, or to the invariant manifold, then you can make the manifold an R9. So, so just terminology, I'll just say nine uh, for, for one nine and, or for R nines if I'm not being uh, specific. Um, so uh, I'll just briefly mention this. Um, that, that projection pi up there is uh, kind of annoying. And um, if you, it actually follows if, if, if you have an R9, there actually always exists a really nice splitting where you replace capital E with ES. And what happens is ES gets preserved by the linearized flow. And so you don't have to ever talk about that projection pi again. And um, so it's really nice mathematically and it's a good way to start proving theorems right away. But, um, and so it's often just part of the definition in the pure math literature. Um, but I like this other definition up top because um, if, you, if you don't already know this fact that the, that the top implies the bottom, then it seems like this is some really special definition that can never be applied to anything because how, do you, how the heck do you ever find an invariant, a d phi t invariant splitting? Um, uh, so just to mention that, because you'll probably in the literature would encounter the invariant splitting version. Um, so another just quick mention, um, you also probably won't find the terminology NIME in the literature, except in my papers. 
what you will find is NIM, N-H-I-M, and NIMs, normally hyperbolic invariant manifolds, they generalize hyperbolic fixed points and hyperbolic um, limit cycles, which don't have to be stable. They can have unstable directions, unstable manifolds. And um, just to avoid saying attracting NIM all the time, it seems convenient to me to introduce the normally attracting terminology. Um, okay, so the main fact about NIMs, or well, the first main fact that makes them, I think, worthy objects of study is that they're robust under perturbation. So if you take a vector field, which has a NIME, and you do small perturbations of the vector field, let's say C1 small perturbations and a suitable C1 topology on the space of vector fields, then um, there's a, a neighborhood in the space of vector fields, a small neighborhood such that for any perturbed vector field in that neighborhood, there will be a unique compact NIME uh, near the original NIME and diffeomorphic to it. Um, I think this is important because we never know the parameters in our models uh, perfectly. And so this tells us that NIMEs should be physically observable. Um, uh, and they should be good, robust um, targets of control, targets for control, for example. Um, now there's an interesting converse, which I think makes the NIMEs even more worthy of study, which is um, roughly speaking, not only are NIMEs persistent under all small perturbations, but NIMEs are the only um, invariant, manifold, invariant manifolds, and there's a bunch of caveats. They're the only isolated compact invariant manifolds, uh, which persist under all small perturbations. Um, it's not to say that they're the only, it's not to say that um, they can't, that other invariant manifolds can't persist to something else. Um, you can certainly have compact invariant manifolds persist to some kind of singular set that's not a manifold. Um, but if you want the, if you want the, if you want to have an isolated compact invariant manifold persist again to an invariant set of the same type, um, then it, it, under all small perturbations, then it has to be a nine. Um, okay, so that's just a bunch of theory. What can you do with it? Um, so here are two questions um, that probably look like they have nothing to do with anything I've talked about so far, but um, they will. So um, they're two very related questions. So the robotics question is, given some robot that has legs and runs around, how can we design a gate that is optimal for it um, uh, with respect to say some metric for optimality without any a priori model of the robot and its interactions with the environment? Um, what if you didn't have a model? What if you didn't want to come up with it? Or what if you didn't trust your model? Um, the biological question I want to ask is um, given observations of an animal running around, so we don't know equations of motion for the animal, um, but we can measure it. How, how do we determine whether the animal's gait is optimal? Um, I think these are hard questions and I hope to convince you that they are. So um, in robotics, um, most hardware in the loop optimizations where you're trying things out on the robot and, iter and iteratively improving it, um, they require large number, a large number of experiments to find the best way to modify the gate to improve the results um, in the best possible way. Because um, if you're thinking about all possible gates, that's a space of loops. That's a that's a space of paths, and so it should be some kind of um, infinite dimensional function space. And um, that's a lot of dimensions. If you imagine a really high dimensional finite dimensional space to calculate the gradient of some function on it, you need to calculate uh, n partial derivatives where n is the dimension of the space. Um, um, in biology, um, you have a kind of a different problem, which is um, if an animal routinely uses only like five gates, how do you get it to try out like 300 other gates to test whether they're all better or worse than the ones that it normally uses. Um, 
I don't think that's very easy. I don't know anyone that knows how to do that. And um, I just have some video here to point out that animals can be really stubborn and um, they, they really just, yeah, I, I, I don't think that this is a, a feasible thing to do. So um, here's one idea to address both problems. Um, so for many goal functionals of interest, for example, um, uh, displacement of uh, displacement of the animal or robot as a result of executing the gate, or um, let's say uh, the energetic cost of the gate, the derivative of the goal functional evaluated at a specific gate actually depends only on the first order approximation of the dynamics uh, about the gate. Because um, when you do some calculus of variations tests, uh, you'll have some, for, for many of these goal functionals, you'll have an integral, you take a derivative, and, the, um, and you integrate by parts, and, and you get Euler-Lagrange equations or something else. And these end up having uh, just derivatives of the dynamics in them. And, um, uh, and if you're just doing a derivative test at the gate, it, it's only going to involve the first order approximation of the dynamics at the gate. And um, so if you could compute a local mo model like this um, relatively efficiently from data, then um, good consequences would, would be, well, in biology, you could compute a lo local model from animal data and then just do, because you have the local model and because of the first bullet above, you can just test directly for gate optimality uh, using standard calculus of variations methods. Um, now, on the robotic side, you could compute a local model um, from a relatively small amount of robot data. Um, if, if that were true, then you could compute the derivative of the goal functional via computer simulation. You, do, you offload the, um, uh, the, the part that would have destroyed the hardware to the computer, and you run the computer hard, and then after you do that, you update the physical robot gate according to what the computer says, and you rinse and repeat. Um, now, I just want to show you how this works um, uh, on the next slide. And the um, the thing I'm going to be illustrating is not my work. It's um, it's the work of Bittner, Hatton, and Revzin from the footnote there. Um, but they've carried this out, um, this idea, assuming for um, uh, assuming that kinematic, uh, th that there's a kinematic reduced order model that's, um, uh, captures the dynamics uh, reasonably well. And okay, so here's what is going on. There's some kind of snake robot and you just have it start out doing kind of any gate you want. And as it's going around in, in a given gate, um, there's a little bit of system noise. And so it's not perfectly going around a trajectory. And that noise is enough to allow this, um, uh, to, to, to get a rich enough data set to allow you to compute a good first order approximation of the dynamics, first order with respect to the cycle. And once you have that first order um, approximation, then you can calculate some kind of finite dimensional approximation of the derivative of your uh, uh, cost functional or goal functional with respect to the gate, with respect to the path itself. Here, they just have some finite dimensional parameterization of the space of paths. And then once you have this gradient, that tells you which direction to step in in the space of all gates. And so that's what you're seeing here. So they start out with kind of a really bad gate. And 20 trials later, they actually end up with something pretty good. Um, so how does that algorithm work? Um, well, first, they're making um, some assumptions. So they're assuming that the configuration space is the product of a uh, space of all shapes, like the shapes of the robot, with some kind of group um, uh, representing position and orientation in the world. Um, typically, it will just be SE2 or SE3, um, just the rigid trans transformations of Euclidean space. Um, and they're assuming that the only external forces on um, the system are, are was exerted by the locomotor, the animal or robots are allowed to try to move, and there's a drag linear and velocity. Um, 
finally, the, the assumptions are just that the physics are smooth and don't depend on um, the group or the position and orientation in most cases. So they're, they're symmetric under this, um, under a lead group action. And um, so following work of uh, Scott Kelly and Richard Murray and Tony Block and others, um, you can do um, some geometric mechanics reasoning and derive just the following uh, general form of the equations of motion. So the first equation, G is uh, representing the position and orientation of the robot or animal. Uh, R is representing the shape of the robot. So like maybe all of its joint angles, for example. P is some kind of term uh, representing um, just, it's, it's like momentum, but it's just the components of momentum that uh, are kind of corresponding to the group. Um, so it's just like, for example, if G was an element of SO3, P would typically be angular momentum. And then there are some other uh, various uh, matrices uh, that just depend on R um, for the most part, the V log and I log just depend on R. And um, now I don't wanna get, spend too much time on the details there, but um, um, what you can do is you can, Think about what if the system has very small, um, what if the robot or animal has very small mass, or what if the damping in the system is very large compared to the mass? And so you can introduce some small parameter epsilon, that's like the ratio of the mass to the damping. And when you just insert this parameter into the equations, what happens is you get a singularly perturbed system. You get in that second P dot equation, you get an epsilon on the left multiplying things. And that's an example of a singularly perturbed system like I mentioned earlier. And if you just formally set epsilon equal to zero and you're kind of careful with how you cancel things, then what happens is you can, so you set epsilon zero, zero on the left of the second equation and on the right, and you substitute the result into the first equation and what you get is this boxed red equation at, at the bottom here. And it's just, there's no P anymore in the equation. It's just, um, it only involves the robot's position and orientation. That's G and G dot. G inverse G dot, you could think of the, the, the derivative of position and velocity, but in the robot or animal's frame of reference. And then R is just the shape of the robot and R dot is the shape velocities. Um, and geometrically, what this corresponds to is um, if you throw away the G coordinate, working in local coordinates, if you throw the G coordinate away because of the symmetry, um, nothing changes in the G direction anyway, then what you get is in um, moment, uh, in this group momentum and shape and shape velocity space, you get an invariant manifold of a particular type it, it happens to be linear in directions parallel to the R prime axis. Uh, so, which makes it in geometric mechanics, what's called a, a connection. And um, because it's a singularly perturbed system, the equations of motion are actually not defined off of this invariant manifold. The system is just um, constrained to it. And I should say this figure is just a cartoon of a, an invariant manifold, not, not one that I generated for an actual system. Um, um, but um, so, okay, so when the system is evolving on a manifold like that, then the dynamics be, uh, become lower dimensional and of this form in, in the red box. And um, so what uh, Bittner and all do is they assume this particular model, just the general form, but it allows them to ignore P, um, do a first order approximation near a gate um, just by Taylor expanding uh, this uh, this matrix a visc um, and what they do is then they just use kind of standard um, uh, least squares regression to fit the terms um, um, and that is what gives them their first order uh, model for the dynamics uh, first order with respect to some gate cycle. Um, now, 
why is this algorithm good? Well, it has some useful properties. Um, so because they're postulating a reduced order model, they have less quantities to compute. Um, also, not only are there fewer quantities to compute, um, one of the quantities that they're not computing, this the momentum, um, is arguably um, arguably momentum is the hardest one of these to to measure, um, uh, and so they only have to deal with the easy to measure quantities. And um, also the the model one, uh, even though it's a kinematic model, it's it's ignoring momentum. It can actually be rigorously justified in the limit that the ratio of inertia to viscosity goes to zero or inertia to damping. Um, but the reduced order model, um, it's only rigorously justifiable in the, in the limit. And in the real world, there aren't any systems that actually have zero inertia or actually have infinite viscosity, um, at least not systems that actually move if they have infinite viscosity. And um, um, so the question arises, um, can we extend the model um, without sacrificing the useful properties above? We can certainly extend the model because the original model was um, valid everywhere, but the original model had uh, extra variables in it. Um, so what I'd like to explain is that you can in fact do this um, using uh, the NIME theory, just using the persistence result that we mentioned earlier. Um, you can develop a more accurate reduced order model of the same dimension, um, valid for um, epsilon small, but non-zero. And um, you can also use this model, um, as I'll try to explain, to produce a new algorithm, which has all of the same useful properties. Um, okay, so here's the idea. Um, for epsilon small, but not zero, we want to show that a normally attracting invariant manifold, a NIME exists. Um, so um, uh, there are some technical details about allowing time dependence. I'm just gonna brush over those. Um, but if you just assume that the shape, uh, the robot's moving its uh, limbs in a way that's not kind of growing unboundedly over time, um, then what you can prove is that indeed for this system, for all sufficiently small epsilon, um, there is um, the invariant manifold uh, that was there for the epsilon equals zero system actually persists to a unique nearby um, uh, exponentially stable invariant NIME having some nice properties. And um, this result was strongly inspired by um, uh, Eldering and Jacobs did uh, had a similar result in uh, 2016 under some stronger compactness assumptions. We needed to lift their compactness assumptions to allow uh, symmetry groups like SE2, which are non-compact. Um, but um, so the rough idea is that you there's this invariant manifold that the system's confined to when epsilon is equal to zero, but then for small um, epsilon, but not zero, that invariant manifold persists um, to one nearby, um, which is close to it, but not identical to it. And um, unlike um, the epsilon equals zero system, now the system is not confined to this manifold. There are, it is possible for the system to have states not on the manifold, but what will happen is there will be a brief transient where these states exponentially converge uh, to this nine, and then they'll stay there and evolve according to a evolve according to a reduced order model. Um, so, um, uh, and I just alluded to it. So it follows from this, um, the persistence theorem for NIMES, um, uh, uh, which is used to prove this result that um, you can write the momentum P as um, some order zero term, which is what, uh, you get when epsilon is equal to zero plus some uh, plus epsilon times some correction term and then plus higher order terms. And if you just take this expression, there's a standard trick in um, geometric singular perturbation theory, which is to you take this equation 
you differentiate both sides with respect to time, and then you substitute what you get back into the, or then you substitute the equations of motion into what you get. And then that will allow you to get um, something interesting on both sides, but you can equate coefficients of like powers of epsilon, and you can just solve for the H1 term. And then once you have this H1 order one correction term, you can plug that into this expression for P and then plug P back into the equations of motion. And that allows you to explicitly compute um, an order one and epsilon uh, correction term to the equations of motion. And you can in principle go higher and compute higher order correction terms, but the algebra um, just gets kind of hairy. Um, so what you get here is you get the same reduced order model as before, but now the, you have an order of epsilon term, but again, with very specific regressors. Now you have one that's linear in acceleration of shape as opposed to velocity. And you also have uh, one which is bilinear in um, the shape velocity. And so um, what we did is we took this new reduced order model and we essentially just took the exact same algorithm of Bittner et al before. But what we did was we added extra regressors to their algorithm suggested by the order of epsilon terms. So with, if you set epsilon equal to zero, you only have um, this R dot term on the right-hand side. And so their regressors evolved, involved only um, uh, some function of, uh, because it's a first order model, some function of phase on the limit cycle, on the gate cycle, and then uh, regressors linear in R dot, we just included regressors linear in, in R double dot and bilinear in R dot. Um, and uh, you can ask, how does this actually compare to the, um, uh, to the um, original algorithm? And we just tested it out in simulation on some toy robot models um, like this. Um, uh, just general n segment swimmer models. And um, uh, what we found, um, I guess, unless anyone asks, I won't, um, I won't spend too much time on the specific performance metrics, but just looking at the top plot, um, uh, just to uh, translate, the higher the curves are, these are, um, uh, these are, each curve is a different degree of freedom of the robot, but the higher the curve is in the top three plots, um, the better the new algorithm does is doing compared to the uh, old algorithm. And the, the plots, so the, the vertical axis in the top three plots is some kind of performance metric. Higher means new algorithm is doing better. The horizontal axis is um, the logarithm of epsilon. And epsilon was the ratio of this ratio of mass to viscosity. And um, it's kind of amazing. It's what happens is sort of exactly what you would expect from theory. When epsilon is very small, well, the, uh, the um, epsilon equals zero is actually a pretty good approximation. And so the new and old models should both do really good. And that's kind of what you see. Um, zero on this axis means that the on zero on the vertical axis in the top three plots means that the models are performing uh, identically because um, it's kind of a ratio metric. And um, uh, then what you find is there's this middle regime of, uh, of this parameter epsilon where um, the, uh, the new algorithm using the new regressors predicted by the model actually performs significantly better. And then when you increase epsilon, um, epsilon becomes large. And, um, and now both models are expected to perform bad because um, uh, the small epsilon assumption is, is violated now. And so what you see is that the um, new model continues to perform better for a while, but then eventually both models seem to become equally bad. Um, so, um, that was uh, one vignette about how persistence of nines can be useful. Um, now I'd like to tell you about the, um, uh, I'd like to tell you about the, um, the next property of, of nines that makes them three reduced order models in one or two, depending on how you count. 
Um, and I think I um, have about 10 minutes more quickly here. Um, so here's a picture. The blue manifold is a nine. And it turns out that nines always had this thing called a stable foliation. And what a stable foliation is, is you get these yellow fibers, which are have complementary dimension to the nine with respect to the ambient space. And they have this interesting property that um, any pair of points starting on the same yellow fiber, they asymptotically coalesce under the flow. And so what's shown here is um, points uh, on each yellow fiber, there's two points. And one of those points is on the manifold itself. And what's illustrated is those two points are coalescing. Um, and so this is a theorem that um, for a nine, there always exists a retraction. Um, and so it's, this is a map which sends some neighborhood, the stability basin of the, of the nine to the nine. WSM is my notation for the stability basin. Um, or stable manifold. And um, so this map P is uh, the identity on the nine. And um, if you take any initial condition X and you project X uh, through P, and then you flow both of them forwards in time, the distance between these pairs of points goes to zero. Um, now, something interesting you can do is if in local coordinates, you, you, uh, you take the local coordinate representation of the output of P, um, you, and then you take um, sort of any transverse set of coordinates, you can, com um, to complete uh, the output of P coordinates, what you'll find is that um, you get coordinates like this, where M is a coordinate for the invariant manifold, and it, depends only on M itself. M dot depends only on M. So this coordinate evolves autonomously independent of these vertical coordinates Z. Um, um, in other words, um, more coordinate invariant terms, this, this um, projection map P, which um, I like to call the asymptotic phase map, um, it's somewhat standard terminology um, because the output of P is in phase, asymptotically in phase with the input. Um, it's a semi-conjugacy in the sense that this diagram commutes for all time. You can flow and project, and that's the same as projecting and then flowing. Um, and so um, NIMES yield reduced order models of all three types considered earlier, because not only do you have an obvious copy of the NIME inside the manifold, it's just, it's already a subset, but you, and not only do you do, do uh, nearby trajectories converge to the nine, so you have this collapse of dimension, but you also have this built in, um, it's totally not obvious that it's built in, but um, it's a theorem that built in is this projection from the basin of attraction um, of the nine to the nine, which respects the dynamics. Um, uh, so these are classical theorems proved in the 70s by Neil Fenichel and um, Hirsch, Pugh, and Schub. Uh, I, I think that they're pretty amazing. Um, um, okay, so um, one of the really common settings, um, maybe the most common way that people have heard of asymptotic phases in the context of limit cycles. So um, in the 70s, uh, a biologist, uh, Winfrey, he was very interested in um, the stable fibers, which is uh, what I call the level sets of the asymptotic phase function. Um, and he called them isochromes um, because um, uh, I think the root word for isochrone is something like same time. And he asked, um, he was really interested, he's a biologist, but he's interested in really fundamental questions about them. Um, so he wanted to know, for example, are they manifolds? Um, uh, and I've already told you that they are, um, but um, so he asked this question. And um, so then uh, a year later, John Guggenheimer wrote this paper um, called Isochrones and Phaseless Sets. And, um, um, and 
really kind of answered Winfrey's question in, in dramatic fashion. Um, but what I want to show you is that um, even though that they are a nice co-dimension one embedded submanifolds that uh, in the case of a limit cycle, they're a very smooth foliation of the entire basin of attraction. Their global geometry can actually be really complicated. So um, not topology, but geometry. So if you, and what's happening in the, in the pictures is they're progressively in, uh, uh, zooming in in this point in the bottom right, the, the, this point that's in the bottom right, the top left plot. And it's kind of, you get this sort of almost fractal-like structure where the, um, the, um, these curves, the purple and blue curves, those are the stable fibers. And you can see they're just winding more and more around um, that point. Um, uh, okay, so I think it's um, asymptotic phase is cool mathematically, but why might you care for applications purposes? Um, well, one, as a dimensionality of a tool, the asymptotic phase contains all non-transient information. It tells you where exactly on the reduced order model will you end up. Um, by thinking about the derivative of the phase map, you can also get insights into how long trajectories spend in different regions of state space, but, um, uh, and that's kind of nice, but what something it's really important for is analyzing synchronization of coupled oscillators. Um, uh, so let's see here. I just wanted to uh, give you an idea about um, how that works in a um, kind of neuroscience example, but um, I think because I'm short on time, I'm just going to skip through this. But um, uh, just I just want to suffice it to say for systems like uh, 1.3 and 1.4 here, where you've got just kind of two coupled systems, each having a limit cycle when epsilon is equal to zero. You can use the asymptotic phase variables for these systems, and you can think of them as circle valued. And um, um, when you take, uh, you can take some derivatives and um, uh, use the fact that the product system when epsilon equals zero has an invariant torus nine given by the product of the individual limit cycles and using this, the, the fact that NIMES persist under perturbations, you can prove that certain uh, terms uh, will be small enough to be neglected and then use averaging theory. And at the end, you find this um, bottom equation, uh, you get, it's like the phase difference of the two uh, uh, subsystems. And what you find is the derivative of the phase difference just equals some term and what's interesting about this term is that um, you can actually compute this term or you, you can experimentally measure um, uh, two of the three things needed to uh, compute this term. Uh, and you can oftentimes control or measure the third term. Um, and so people in neuroscience, um, uh, they really like uh, to use this to analyze synchronization of um, neurons, for example, or neuron populations. Um, um, okay, so um, just to skip ahead a little bit. So remember earlier, we um, for a general nine, we had um, these local de decoupling coordinates, which are defined on some neighborhood of the nine. And um, something that I was interested in with um, uh, Yap Eldering and my PhD advisor, Shai Revzin, was... Um, can you extend those coordinates? Are they valid on the entire basin of attraction? That seems nice if that were true. Um, because equation two here is a really simple form of the equations of motion. And um, so um, indeed uh, you can. So here's a simple version. Assume that um, uh, the manifold happens to be a level set of some submersion that, that in the reason for that is it implies it's topologically not too twisted in the way it sits inside the ambient space. And then it follows that um, there actually exist coordinates of the form two, which are valid on the entire basin of attraction, not just on some small piece on the entire thing. So it's like a global coordinate system. Um, and it's kind of surprising if you look at this picture, because as you, you keep zooming in towards this point, it looks, things keep getting crazier and crazier. 
Um, but what happens is the coordinate change gets crazier and crazier as you get near that point. Um, so the more there's a more like general nice geometric version of the theorem that doesn't assume that uh, submersion condition. And uh, what it says is that these stable fibers, which are known to form a foliation, uh, they actually form what's known as um, a fiber bundle, a disc bundle, and which just means you can globally straighten out fibers um, or pieces of fibers as opposed to just um, small little patches. Um, and we went a little bit further and we actually generalized that um, uh, result to allow the invariant manifold to have a boundary. So as long as the vector field points inward at the boundary, um, you also get very nice global coordinates. But then we, we went a little bit further and showed that not only uh, can you get coordinates like this, where the first equation doesn't really tell you much about Z, you can go further and make that first equation, replace Z with Y. You can make Y dot almost, almost linear. It is linear in, the t in a time varying sense. Um, um, so this can tell you a lot about the Y dot equations. Um, what happens to the dynamics, not just, not just what's their ultimate fate, but what happens to them during the transient phase. Um, um, and what I would, uh, what I was hoping to tell you about is um, there are systems for which you can actually find linear LTI changes of coordinates, um, but, uh, and, and they're connected with um, the theory of Koopman Eigen functions. And um, uh, I just wanna say that um, there have been some exciting proposals recently for um, the usefulness of coordinate systems like uh, those and how they connect with Kuban Eigen functions for treating uh, things like Parkinson's disease or um, migraines or, or studying cardiac arrhythmias and jet lag um, in some of the references down here. Um, and um, I guess what I'll just briefly mention is, um, um, well, because there's interest in, in using these um, nice linearizing coordinates, there's been a lot of interest in developing algorithms to prove that they exist. And um, if you want to analyze the theoretical properties of any algorithm to, to, to compute something, it'd be nice to have theoretical guarantees to know if the things you're computing exist and are unique. And something that I did with David Hong and Shai Revzin is we came up with some pretty general theorems um, uh, in the paper in this reference, in the paper, two papers in, uh, in this footnote, we came up with some pretty general theorems for when do these uh, linearizing coordinates, Koopman Eigen functions exist. And we came up with, in some cases, a complete classification of all of the Eigen functions um, for systems having an attracting hyperbolic equilibrium or periodic orbit, um, not a general nine. Um, so, um, I think with that, I'd like to conclude. Um, so uh, I hope to have convinced you that NIMES yield reduced order models of multiple simultaneous types. Um, they're robust to perturbations and conversely, um, and this, robust, this robustness can be exploited to correctly extend um, uh, reduced order models away from some very idealized regime. Um, I think it would be interesting and, um, to explore and I'm curious, um, whether other real world systems uh, can similar or are, are, are amenable to similar uh, 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 corrections to reduced order models. Um, and I have one example of, in, in the footnote. Um, um, I also talked about how for a NIME, there exists a map, which is uh, a nice semi-conjugacy and retraction, which outputs the asymptotic phase or ultimate fate of the input. Um, uh, which is conceptually satisfying, I think, useful for, for model reduction and useful for analyzing uh, synchronization of coupled oscillators. Um, so one question I have, two questions I have, um, could this phase map also be useful for analyzing synchronization of general NIMES? Um, can we compute the phase map using uh, machine learning uh, approaches? Um, 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 and I didn't get to talk about these last ones, so I'm just going to 
stop here and say um, thank you very much for your attention. And I'd be happy to answer any questions if there's any time. Thank you, Matthew, for the great talk. I think we still have a couple of minutes for some questions, if there are. Uh, are there questions from the audience? Uh, um, so you showed this theory and it has, it, it's very general, right? It could do, capture many kinds of systems. And my, my question was, if you have a gut feeling of the final application in robotics, where you, where you can really show that you are uh, doing way better than the state of the art in, in creating controllers or, or... Yeah, I think, um, well, there are a lot of people in robotics already doing great work um, uh, in designing and controlling robots based on um, reduced order models. Um, I work in Code Lab, and in Code Lab, there's a, a lot of talk about using, um, they call them templates for the, um, for dynamics, um, making, they try to make the robots behave as though they were some low dimensional uh, template and people are already doing a lot of that. Um, um, so I, I think, I think what, I, I so I, I don't know that um, the, some of the properties I was talking about, I think where they can do uh, the most good is in providing formal guarantees for some things that people are doing. I think the asymptotic phase property is something um, which could be, I think, used to um, easily prove a lot of like convergence properties that people either don't prove or uh, might have to prove in a more complicated way because um, they might not know about this like general um, uh, hard theorem that people in the, in the 70s, not me, um, um, worked on. Um, but I, uh, I also think that um, I'm actually really curious. I don't, I don't know a good answer. I'm also curious about the, um, so in the first part of my talk, I've talked about how you could correct reduced order models using the persistence property by solving for like correction terms. And I think that that would be really interesting to see in, um, because the theory only works right now for smooth systems, not hybrid ones. I think, I think that the territory is most ripe in, um, sort of like soft robotics areas. Um, uh, any robotic system, I think, where there's strong damping um, or small mass, I think, I think that, I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit for, for computing like corrected, or like not zeroth order kinematic models of things, but like first and second order kinematic models. Um, I'm just thinking, I'm thinking out loud a little bit. I, 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 I realize I haven't answered your question. Um, no, no, you I, have, you have. I think I, uh, I have a picture now. I, 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 think, I think the answer to your question, the honest one is I, I don't know what I think the ultimate uh, application of these ideas is. I would love to generalize these ideas to hybrid systems because I think hybrid systems are, so, are really important for modeling legged robots. Um, and that's something uh, which I think I, I think that could be really useful for, I think that could provide a lot of, um, I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in, in um, understanding reduced order models of hybrid systems. You perfectly answered the question. And actually uh, regarding the soft robots, I, uh, there is a guy, Andrew Spielberg from MIT, was working on, rob on soft robots and gave a talk at these autonomy talks. And actually one of the problems he's looking at is exactly finding guarantees for soft robot design. Oh, so maybe, interesting. Maybe Could I can- me, Can you tell me the name again? Andrew Spielberg from oh. uh, CSAIL uh, in MIT work, working with Daniela Russ. Was that talk um, this semester? Yeah, yeah, you find, the, you find the talk. Later I can follow up with the, with the details if you want. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll, uh, I, I remember the name. I'll, I'll, I'll watch that talk. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for the great talk. I think now it's time to, I don't see any other question popping up or people uh, waving hands. So I guess 
that's it for today. Thank you very much for the talk. It yeah, was very thank interesting. You for me. And uh, I will follow up with the video and uh, good luck for the next steps. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care.